Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Jasmine Wahi. Jasmine's a curator and cultural empresario who curates <laughs> exhibitions internationally, mostly dealing with issues of cultural identity, intersectionality, female empowerment, and the symbiotic relationship between art and social movements. Jasmine began her art world endeavors in the South Asian art department of Christie's Auction House and followed that with positions in several contemporary Asian art galleries around New York City. In 2008, she opened her own art consultancy, which produced exhibitions and cultivated emerging artists from around the world. Jasmine's curatorial mission has been to incorporate art history, contemporary art practice, and critical engagement into a larger discourse on social issues. She's expanded her curatorial ventures to include a multitude of nonprofit endeavors and socially engaging exhibitions. In 2010, she co-founded Project for Empty Space, an organization that creates socially engaging, multidisciplinary art exhibitions and programming that encourage social dialogue, education, and systemic change for cultural uh, tolerance. That's in Newark. In 2013, she and Project for Empty Space began a long-term partnership with Rebecca Jampol of Solo's Project House to create a series of pop-up exhibitions under the moniker Gateway Project Spaces, which then became Gateway Project. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Vice News, Hyperallergic, and the Huffington Post, among many others. Jasmine received a BA in art history from New York University and was a graduate student at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. We're happy to have her as a faculty member here at SVA. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine Wahi. Thanks. Um, so I usually don't prepare anything for these types of talks because they always seem to change because something happens that is socially relevant right before. And then I'm like, what am I even talking about? This is so three days ago. So pardon me, this is a little off the cuff. Um, and because Mark said I can do whatever I want, you're going to get two talks because I know a lot of you don't know me, so I'm just going to give you a little introduction, and then we're going to talk about some other stuff. Um, so this is me a couple years ago, um, and I'm not just a narcissist. This uh, picture kind of embodies how I feel as, as, a, as a feminist, as a curator, as a woman, um, and it was part of a series called the Unsuitable Girls series, which took predominantly South Asian women um, who worked with the photographer and artist Anjali Bhargava and Swathi Karana to create a pseudo alternate identity using sort of negative superlatives that would disrupt the norms um, that people often associate with South Asian women. And so I was given some choices, and again, because I am a narcissist, I picked least orthodox goddess and um, decided to be photographed in a historic church on, in Midtown, uh, sorry, historic cathedral um, with my then partner. Um, and this photo has made the rounds. Um, it's been in the Smithsonian. It's received a lot of flack um, for reasons that I didn't really understand at the time, um, but because of the sacrilege of the Pieta stance, um, because I am not white, because my partner is obviously not white. Um, and thusly, it's my favorite photo of myself. Um, because it is defiant and kind of badass. Um, so I guess I should explain very briefly how I identify myself. Um, I'm a curator, obviously. Um, I consider myself to be an activist or just really outspoken. Um, and I am a multi-positional culture of one, um, which is a term that I borrowed from an artist friend of mine, um, Jarrett Videra, who coined it as part of his thesis, which means I consider myself 
not part of the binary dynamics of any particular place. Um, I'm a children, first generation child of immigrants um, and thusly am never particularly Indian or South Asian enough, but never truly American. I think my perspective on everything in life has from my art practice to my love life to my friends has been informed by this particular position of having um, a plurality of perspectives, which we all have, um, but I like to pretend that I'm unique in this endeavor. So just to jump right into it. As Mark mentioned, I'm the co-founder of Project for Empty Space, which originally started out as a nomadic project in which um, my collaborators and I would find places all over the world and collaborate with other curators and artists to create temporal site-specific installations. Um, this was the first one that we did on the Lower East Side, and the artist was a Pakistani, she still is Pakistani, she's still alive, um, is a Pakistani artist who created an installation in this lot that had been deserted for about 20 years, um, 20 plus years, that was owned by the city of New York, and the city of New York refused to let the neighbors ever do anything with this space after they tore down the building. It was a NYCHA property, um, and when the zoning laws changed, they basically just left it as a blighted space. Um, so if anyone's ever interested in starting a nonprofit, what you do is you just dial 311 and ask the city if they have any space. That's not at all what you do, but that's what I did. And somehow by sheer luck, um, the city was like, yeah, we have this space that no one wants to take care of, especially not us. So take it, do something with it. Um, I think I'm the only person in the history of the world who has ever gotten anything done that expediently with the government in New York City. Um, but it happened, and that was sort of the beginning of the end for me. I had been, or the beginning of the beginning, I had been working um, in galleries and auction houses on the commercial art side, but really what I wanted to do was curate programs that were community oriented. Um, and so we did this project in which Tenney took reclaimed wood from all around the neighborhood and from Build It Green, which is a great resource if anyone needs building materials for on the cheap. Um, and she built a structure that reflected the aesthetic history of that neighborhood. Um, this neighborhood has since changed quite a bit in the seven years since we did this project. Um, but it was a phenomenal experience and we ended up turning what was a small project, uh, sort of a one-off project, into an organization and subsequently did projects in Bogota, in uh, Quebec, all around New York City, and then eventually in Newark. Um, I'm not gonna read this big old long thing because you guys all go here and presumably all know how to read. Um, but these are just some examples of the types of projects that we did. Um, this project was in Dumbo, and it was a collaboration with a group called The Other Theater, which um, is a group from Montreal. Um, and basically, they created social commentary through participatory audio experiences. So I like this experience because it basically brought together strangers um, between five and 30 strangers at a time who were each given different audio prompts um, that told them that had basically different soundscapes. Um, and the entire narrative was actually about a woman who had been the victim of gender violence and was contemplating suicide. But no one who participated in the project actually knew the full narrative because they only were given directions or heard music in ways that they would interact with other people. So the spectacle was sort of twofold. It was a spectacle for the participants because they were seeing other people interact with them but didn't know why. And then, of course, the surrounding audience got to sort of see this story that was 
primarily abstract unfold. Um, and so the people you see in the photograph, this was at the Dumbo Arts Fest, I think it was 2012, it may have been 2013. Um, but they were all strangers and it was a fascinating project to participate in. Um, and that was actually the first time we started doing more audience-based projects where artists were asked to deliberately, well, they were actually required in our project for these based iterations to invite the public to be part of the work. Um, so a couple years ago, my now business partner, Rebecca, um, invited me to Newark because she had been invited to activate it, to activate a space that did not look like this at the time. It was a, a vacant office space. So the image you're seeing now is what we did after we eventually took over the lease and gutted the place. Um, but I actually didn't include any pictures, but you can, if you can imagine it had dark blue carpet and drop ceilings and cubicles and was generally a miserable space. Um, so we were basically invited to activate the space in its current form um, to create a space for communities. And I guess to give a little bit more context about where the space is, is it's attached to a train station, um, Newark Penn Station. And it's sort of the indoor street concourse that takes people from the train station to downtown Newark. Um, and the reason it was originally built was as a way to basically keep corporate people from having to interact with like the general filth of Newark, as they put it when they build the building, which is obviously a disgusting premise and has been sort of the blighted legacy of this building. And so the new owners of the building were smart and realized that there was a huge stigma around this space and so thought it was smart to let us come in there <laughs> and didn't really know what they were signing up for. Um, because in case well, you'll be able to tell soon enough that I do things that are generally sort of political, um, and the politics are my politics. Um, and if you don't like them, um, you can fuck off, basically, is how I feel. Um, so we have the space, um, and our objective is to create a white box space that is more that creates a feeling that is more equitable. So anyone and everyone should come into this space. It is not restrictive. The work is meant to be consumed by no particular demographic, but every demographic. And it's intended to encourage dialogues that create, hopefully, at least a tolerance, if not, again, um, equitable spaces for everyone. Um, those are lofty ideals, as Rebecca and I have discovered. Um, I don't usually share this with people, but I'm feeling kind of spunky today. So this sign that you see, um, we put up, the Black Lives Matter sign, we put up in September, I think. Um, and since the day that we put it up, it's actually down now because we have another sign up, but from the day we put it up to about four weeks ago, every week someone came and spit on our windows um, because they did not agree. So that's the kind of audience that we sometimes deal with. And I'm okay with it, minus cleaning the spit off the windows, which I do not recommend to anyone. Um, but for me, as a curator um, and as an activist and just a human, it's something that I welcome, minus the part that the person has never actually come into the space to talk to us about their angst with the messaging. Um, but it's something that I welcome because I want spaces, and not just my space, but all spaces that are art spaces, to be 
places for conversation um, and social dialogue, and all opinions are, are welcome. So these are just some images from shows that we have done in the past two years since we reopened. Um, on the left is a piece by David Antonio Cruz, who is one of our artists in residence. For those of you who are interested after graduating, I encourage all of you to apply to our artist in residence program. Um, shameless plug, it is a year. One of your alumni is in it right now, Delano Dunn. Um, and the premise of the residency program is that people can choose a topic or topics that incorporate some type of, or encourages some type of social discourse or dialogue. Um, so people have picked a range of topics. Um, David explored brown queer bodies and the male to male gaze. Um, the other image is from Grace Grope Pollard, um, and we did an exhibition about the difference between justice and the justice system. Um, what else we got here? These are just some other images from exhibitions that we've done. So that's basically Project for Empty Space. Um, we are in Newark. We've done projects both in our space and more in the public, in parks. We're branching out further from the downtown area into the other wards. Um, we will start doing projects, nomadic projects, again in 2018 um, and hope to be in India, in Delhi primarily, and Washington, D.C., which is where I'm from. And then very briefly, um, some of the projects that I work on independently are mostly oriented around feminism, um, female empowerment, and it took me a couple of years to realize that all of my shows were pretty much about the same thing, um, which I just mentioned. So this is an image from a show that I did in Delhi um, several years ago. It was the first show that I did there. And I always bring this show up because even though it was a sort of painful experience for me, um, professionally painful experience, um, because what happened was I showed work by I think eight women artists who were both from, who lived in the subcontinent or were like me, first generation, who were returning to show there. Um, and I was very naive in thinking that this show would be well received, but I got a lot of pushback from the gallery community saying that they didn't understand why anyone would do a show like this. And the show was based on the premise that uh, sex and violence are, can be intrinsic to female empowerment. And so I had one woman write me a nasty email that said, what kind of women still need to be empowered? So that sort of laid the foundation for me to keep doing shows like this. Um, these are other images from other shows that I've done in the past couple years. Um, on the left is work by Rashad Newsom. On my left is work by Rashad Newsom um, that explored trans feminism. Um, on the other image is Yana Evans um, performing in a festival, one night festival that I put together um, called Pervasive Feminisms. Um, and she got a lot of trouble for being on the altar. Did not, no, that was not allowed. Um, so I'm just gonna go back to the show in Delhi because this is sort of a segue for the next part. Um, in the image, it's not very clear, but the images on the wall are performance documentation um, by an artist who's now based, actually, she was based out of Boston. I think she's since moved back to Pakistan. Phenomenal uh, performance artist, multidisciplinary, actually. Um, and in this performance, it is her performing a ritual bathing exercise in Greece um, in which she is the woman who is washing the other woman who happens to be white. Um, and this was the piece in this show that got, I think, the most vehement pushback. And I realized, though, it was sort of tacitly implied. 
I realized later that the reason people didn't like this was because the woman, the nude woman was white. And it wasn't, the general sense wasn't that the uh, South Asian woman was in a position of subservience, which I would see as a problematic factor and which is sort of what the whole point of the work is. Um, but the issue was that it was offensive to see a white female body because the white female body is pure and chaste and because of colonialist hangups should not be seen in such a compromising position. Um, which, I'm just gonna let that simmer there actually. I'm not gonna say anything else about it except for um, that type of discourse was also what sort of got me into a further more academic or intellectual exploration of intersectional feminism. Here's another image that, let me just see, okay. As I segue into the participatory part of this, um, I just want everyone to look at this image for a second. This is, again, from the same festival that um, I put together at this church in Brooklyn. And just look at it. So before I, I get into the next part, I'm going to ask you guys what you notice about this image. And let me first say a caveat, I actually loved this piece, but I had some issues with it. So who wants to take a stab at what the problematic part of this is? Yes. Exactly, you win. <laughs> so, okay, so to go back to the caveat, this performance was participatory, of course. Um, no one was forced to be in the buff and run around the church naked for 45 minutes. Um, but the participants were reflective of the audience. Um, and what I took away from this was that this was not really such a safe place or it doesn't feel like a safe or inclusive place for people of color. Um, and that is sort of my segue into the conversation around feminism. And the reason I decided to talk about feminism today is because in the past few weeks, well, <laughs> it's because it's all I ever talk about, let's be honest. Um, but in the past few weeks, past few months actually since the election, um, I have been invited to do a lot of talks about feminism um, and particularly around the conversation around the Women's March. Um, and I got into what I consider to be a very healthy and productive discussion um, on NPR about why as a woman of color I attended the march in Washington, which again I'll get into a little bit later. But um, before going into why there is even a, a discourse around why one would or wouldn't participate in the march, um, I am going to ask you guys some questions. Okay, if you feel comfortable answering any of these questions, please raise your hand. I have been the victim of gender-based violence. Um, I have witnessed gender-based violence. I'm a feminist. I believe that gender and or race and or economics are often intrinsically intertwined in discrimination against women of color. Oh good. Um, I have been the victim of gender and or race-based workplace discrimination. I have stood silently by as female identifying persons have been harassed because of their gender identity and or racial identity and or economic position. I have harassed someone because of their gender and or race. I have felt violated because of my gender and race. In the face of gender and or race violence, I have 
So these prompts or statements um, are part of a project that I have going on right now at the gallery. Um, it's probably the one and only time I'll actually make some type of art. Um, but it's called the Pussy Polaroid Project. And what we do is we invite people to hold up these statements and then um, respond to them uh, digitally. So they'll either write it or text it to me. And we have an Instagram account where we share the photos and the responses. Um, and at the end of this project, we now, I think, have uh, close to 200. Um, and you might see some people here you recognize. Um, we are sending all of the responses and the Polaroids to our dear vice president um, so he can not only see what the reality of gender and race discrimination is in this country, but also see that this is what America looks like. Okay, so how many of you guys know what intersectionality is? Okay, good. Here's a definition for you all to read. And to put it very simply, um, it is basically the idea, as one of the statements implied before, that gender, race, and economic status are often in collusion with each other in the perpetuated marginaliza marginalization of people of color, but particularly in my area of interest, women of color. Um, and what I would like to assert is that everyone, and I mean everyone, should know what this term means and how it affects everyone else. Because I know, I know what it is, and I know a lot of other women of color know what it is. I know a lot of women of color don't know what it is. But speaking very candidly, we as women of color are not the ones who need to know. Because we already know. We live it. Um, and in order to create equitable spaces for everyone again, um, we all need to understand it and work toward, by understanding we can work towards how we can make change. Um, without understanding it, or without knowing about the concept of intersectionality, it becomes very difficult to do something about it, um, because you can't fix what you don't know exists. So the one and only thing I'm going to read is this statement. If you truly believe in equitable space, not just based on gender or race, you must understand visionary feminist politics. The idea that education as a conduit for, at a minimum, sympathy moving towards empathy is essential. It's not enough for white people to claim feminism as a means of larger social equity, sorry, of larger social equality because that is a false and flawed promise. It is more essential that white women in particular, but all of us, understand and acknowledge that the legacy of not simply benefiting significantly from class and race privilege, but to understand that the skewed hierarchy that women of color are on the lower rungs affects all of us, white women, men, men of color, everyone which is why I've made it my personal mission to spread this idea, no matter how irritating it may be. I used to say I wanted to share with those who wanted to know, to the allies as the woke women, but now I want everyone to know. I don't care if you don't care. My goal is to spread the word of visionary feminism free of race and gender-based hierarchy with no apologies and no stops. I'm not suggesting that our competitive nature, just as humans, is bad, but that it should be based on other hierarchical structures that are organically formulated, i.e. not based on perpetuated patriarchal issues of marginality being race, gender, and economics, or all three. So having said that, my personal mission or task to all of you 
is to get out there and learn about intersectionality and intersectional feminism and share it with everyone you can. Because at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, these inequities and these discriminations affect you. And with that, I will take questions. Um, I did not actually, I was not really that aware at that time of that work. Um, I was actually drawing, even though that makes much more sense than what I was drawing from, but from um, Pushpamala and her cinematic works, because that photo is obviously very dramatic, as well as from um, the Baroque, which I'm just aesthetically in love with. Um, Pushpamala and is an artist. Um, she's a photographer. Yeah, um, yeah, she's phenomenal. She's based in Delhi, um, and she's done a series. People refer to her as the Indian Cindy Sherman. I think that's a gross comparison, but um, she is phenomenal and generally uses uh, old Bollywood cinema and old Hindu mythology to construct these portraits, self-portraits. We are. Um, that's my goal. We've taken a sort of hiatus from it in the past year, well, two years, um, because there's just two of us. But my goal next year is to start doing it again. We did one project in uh, outside of our space in Newark last year. Um, but yeah, the goal is to go everywhere. So what I initially thought was that people took issue with Hamra being the washer um, because of the implication, the very obvious implication of um, the acquiescence of the South Asian woman to the white woman. Um, but it was the opposite. People were shocked to see um, the white female form in such a compromising way. And I do think that is sort of this hang-up that people still have. Um, and it might not be necessarily uh, conscientious, but that people have in valorizing the British um, or the colonists, even though, well, it, I, guess, I guess it hasn't been that long. It's been less than 100 years versus hundreds of years of colonialism. but. Um, I just found it interesting because people, there's such a general projection of nationalism in post-partition, post-colonial India, and yet people still have these very real hang-ups. Thank you. Um, I think it's just because I, I live it. Um, people, say, people say crazy stuff to everyone. Um, People say a lot of crazy stuff to me, and I guess at one point in my life I would have been upset about it or like butt hurt about it. But now I think that everyone has room and the capacity to grow. Um, and so until someone like physically assaults me, I'm okay with trying to have a conversation with them because I want my experience in, in life to. Well, I've had a great experience in life, but I want everyone to be able to uplift everyone else or at least understand where they're coming from. Yeah, um, I think everyone should go to therapy, whether you think you should or not. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I have gone through rough times for sure. Um, that show that I did in Delhi left me really devastated um, for months after I did it. Um, and I actually, to this day, have not done any shows in India for that reason. Um, you know, I'll talk about the experience endlessly, but I don't want to be in that position again. Um, I did receive numerous threats of physical assault after that show. Um, and that's the primary reason that 
uh, I have not returned to India to do that type of work. Oh yeah, I didn't even talk about that. Um, so the pushback I got was from mostly from other women of color. Um, and I understand the, the rationale for why a lot of people didn't march because they didn't, um, women of color in particular, black women, um, did not, a lot of them have told me they didn't feel safe um, in a space that was predominantly a white female space. Um, and the legacy of feminism in this country has been the mainstream understanding and legacy that most people have of feminism um, is predicated on the white female experience, which historically has kind of cut out women of color um, and sort of, and again, this is not any individual, but sort of the larger narrative has um, disregarded the factors of race and economic status as uh, inherent to further marginalization. So ultimately, one of the narratives is that the only people that benefited from mainstream feminism were white women. Um, and therefore, a lot of people felt that A, it wasn't safe to go, um, B, there is a sense of where were these other women in the past legacy since the civil rights or before that? Um, why is everyone showing up to the party now? And I guess my, well, my first stance is no one should do what they don't want to do. If you don't feel comfortable in a space, you don't have to participate in it. Um, there's no rule that says, because everyone says you should do this, you should do this, or you shouldn't. Um, no one should be penalized or villainized for participating or not participating, and I think that goes both ways. I think that the women who chose to participate in the march um, should be commended, and the people who didn't, it's okay that you didn't. Um, my attitude in general is, better late to the party than never, um, which is why I'm such an advocate about sort of spreading the understanding of intersectionality as the new mainstream narrative of what feminism is. Um, because again, I think if people want to participate in something but they don't necessarily know the history or the legacy or why people feel disenfranchised or have been left out or people have felt that they've been left out of the conversation, how can they fix it? But I'm also an activist and so I participate in these activities in these spaces because I feel like it's my job. Um, not everyone is an activist, not everyone has to be. So yeah, I guess the pushback that I've gotten is basically people criticizing me for participating, um, but then also a lot of people understand why I did participate, so. Okay, so full disclosure, it was exhausting because we brought our entire um, grab back crew of like 20 women to my parents' house in outside of DC and spending like three days with that many adult activist feminist women is exhausting. Um, and I needed like several vacations and several seats afterwards. But um, my experience was actually amazing. I think that the march, like any large, very quickly organized event had a lot of problems, um, but they weren't major problems and I felt a sense of great solidarity. Um, I know a lot of people have talked about like protest selfie is the new selfie. I'm okay with that. I'm, you know, I know a lot of people drop off uh, as activism starts to lose its popularity or people move on to other stuff, but I was glad that people showed up. So my ex experience minus like the exhaustion and the drama was, was good. Yeah, yeah, their only problem was they didn't have enough speakers. I mean, audio speakers, not women speaking. No, there were like a thousand, there were a thousand and one speaking 
women speaking for like 12 hours and then what's his name, Michael Moore? I'm like, Michael Moore, why are you up here? <laughs> like I know, I know you gave money, but like can we just have a moment like by ourselves? Anyway. Yeah, pretty much, despite his narrative, alternate facts. Right, that's a great question. Um, when I was presenting it, like I said, I was really, really naive in thinking that people who were, um, the people that are going to galleries, as I'm sure you know, are, you know, it's not the 99%, it's like the 0.01%. And my ignorance and um, sort of prejudice, I guess, was that everyone would be sort of in the same boat as me as believing that there was a reason for these types of shows. So I went in like guns blazing, being like, everyone is gonna be like, yes. Um, I had a piece in there that said, I just lost my heart on, it was a wall text piece. And like, no one even got it and the people that got it were so upset. Um, so, because the piece was by a, a female, um, uh, Divya Mera. Um, so the answer to that question is, I didn't go in prepared at all, but that experience uh, is now the reason that I do bring definitions um, and other information so that people, again, people who want to know, they can then ask, and, or they don't have to ask, it's just presented there for them. We do, okay, so I totally forgot I had one more slide. Oh, no. Shameless plug for exhibitions. Your guys' colleague, Delano, has a show that I curated. It's on Sunday, and tomorrow we're opening um, Zoe Buckman's exhibition about gender violence, um, not exactly gender violence, but uh, the conflict between traditional ideas of femininity and um, versus masculine strength and gender violence. Um, and that's part of this program that we have going on until the beginning of June called the Grab Back Incubator. So Zoe is the second of four shows that we're presenting. Um, the incubator was totally an impromptu idea that we decided to after the election much to our other artist chagrin, we moved all of their shows until later in the year and just like impromptu put this program together, um, which has a mini residency involved in it. Um, and I'm really excited to say that we're actually going to be doing the residency again next year um, from January to June with female identifying artists talking, exploring ideas of feminism. We have, the, we have a feminist library and we do have several talks and open discussions coming up, which are um, actually, I'm hoping, will be as open and unhindered, or you can say unpolitically correct, but uh, as raw as possible. So again, women of any background can ask other women of different backgrounds open and candid questions and get open and candid answers without any sort of sense of repercussion. So those will be posted on our Facebook and our website and my ever self-aggrandizing Instagram as they come up. And it'll be through June 1st. So when the market crashed in 2007, um, the gallery I worked for closed, and I started doing some temp work, um, marketing temp work, and I just started this organization. Let me tell you, when the market crashed, New York was a lot cheaper than it is now, so I just like kind of flew by the seat of my pants and started doing my own thing, and most of any minor success that I've had has been attributed to luck. Um, but yeah, I just, I was working with friends who um, were at NYU undergrad with me who were artists and we just started doing projects together. Yes. It's not just luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, 
Anyone else? You got you guys can also ask me questions afterwards. Cause I feel like everyone's tired and it's kinda hot up here. 